Okay, so welcome back everybody from the exam. Now today is going to be one of the last two things that we're going to be talking about, which is actually a very important section right here. So here we have is payroll, okay? Payroll is going to be one of the major parts of your business because especially if you are willing to even have employees. So, the big major cost or expense to the company is going to be paying for your employees. So you always want to make sure that when you think about this, do you truly want to have employees? You have to think about how you're going to compensate them. What taxes are you subject to pay for and the employee is subject to pay for? Because at the end of the day, if you do have employees, you have to know that you have to hold on to their money and pay the government. So you have to be very careful there, okay? Other things too is if you even want to offer benefits to your employees or any extra deductions. And we're going to go ahead and talk about each and every single one. So of course, again, business, if you have, if you're planning to have employees, it's going to cost you probably a, a bit the, one of the biggest portions of your company's expenses is being able to pay your employees because you know whether you put them on a specific pay period right if you're going to have them work for you you are legally by law have to pay them okay because if you don't pay your employees they're just gonna, they're going to leave your company so with that being said Let's go ahead and actually dive right into actually setting up and how to even have a place. So the very first thing that you need to know is that in order to properly file your taxes to the government, okay, you need to have what's called a uh, employee identification number. Now this is very useful and it's very helpful, especially when you do business. But if you're a sole proprietor, um, you do have that leeway where you don't have to apply for a business, um, an employer identification number. You can just simply use your uh, social security number. However, there are some guidelines and rules on using this because, again, the very first thing that you should do as a sole proprietor is to have a separate um filing taxes right one for personal and one for your actual business now as a sole proprietor it is actual a personal tax that you can write off your taxes if you own your own company or you own a business right so it's a double win it's a double um, whammy for you not only do you get to be um, uh, taxed at a lower rate because as a individual you also get a smaller tax break off of owning a company itself so it's good if you if you want to but most cases the best way that you want to keep track of your personal and your business um, taxes is to create or apply for an um, employee identification number so here's just an example of what the difference is uh, when you apply for one Okay, obviously Social Security, it's, um, it's, um, it's, been, it's uh, issued by the Social Security itself, and on top of that, um, the numbers are a little different, right? It's your name, it goes three, two, then four, right? Total of nine numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas your employee identification number, okay? So again, any business that wants to apply for one, right, they could be a sole proprietor, partnership, corporation, most likely, 100%, as you go up in the uh, business um, entities, right, if you are upgrading yourself from a sole proprietor to a corporation or you're planning to be incorporated, it is mandated that you have a employee identification number, all right, for tax purposes. You, can, you shouldn't use your Social Security whatsoever, but sole proprietors, they can use their Social Security if they prefer to. Of course, with that, it's issued by the IRS, obviously, because it's for taxes, and how their numbering is actually a little different. So you're going to get a little card, business card. It's two numbers first, and then the seven digits right after. So that's how you can tell the difference between a Social Security and an employer identification number. All right? 
So again, uh, rule of thumb is if you are going to business, you should apply for an IEN. I -E -I -N, okay? Now, once you've done that and you have a uh, tax number that is going to be taken out from the business, the next thing that you want to do is you need to, uh, 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 you need to know how to apply for one. All right? So, excuse me. So this is going to be the form SS4 form. So it's, it allows you to apply for an employer identification number. So again, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, once you establish you are a legal uh, business entity, you're going to fill out the form just the way it is, answer the questions on how you can do this. And on obviously, you, uh, you'll receive the identification number soon. Now, of course, with that, um, you need to also know what kind of taxes that you are dealing with, especially if you're um, in either retail or some kind of um, separate different company that does have special taxes. So for example, like you may sub be subject to, um, to employment tax, right? Other taxes could include, um, you know, special taxes for if you, if you are a company that's, that sells like alcohol or tobacco, right? You have to exercise those special taxes. So uh, those are very important than sales tax, okay? So, just a little FYI, so make sure when you go into business, you know what your guidelines and your uh, taxes that you are subject to, especially when you sell a specific product, okay? Um, and also knowing which, uh, what kind of sales tax that you are subject to be doing, because we talked about this very briefly, right? Tax is uh, going to be considered where the state that you belong in, but also what local area you belong into, what county you belong into. Okay, so with that, you can fill this um, little form from irs.gov, okay, all forms that you see on this uh, particular uh, PowerPoint will be, uh, you're able to get them all at irs.gov, everything here. So here is the SS4 form to apply for an employer identification number, okay. Now, of course, when you have employees, right? You have to think about what types of employees that exist in the business perspective, okay? So here, um, there's more information at irs.gov, but these are typically the, the six that you would normally actually see. The other ones that are listed at irs.gov, they have borderline different, uh, different little specific different tasks that we do to, to qualify at them as a type of employee. Same thing here, but these are the more common ones that you do see as part for a business, right? You have your common law employee, or also known as your regular employee, right? They are typically your either salary or wage based, eight to five, um, you know, average eight hours a day, or eight to 12 hours, right? They have either the choice of that, or they could also be a salary based regular employee. Then you have your statutory employee. Okay, your statutory employees, again, we will talk about every single one, um, so don't worry about that, all right? Then we're going to talk about your statutory non-employees, then you're going to also talk about independent contractors, um, it, and then also individuals that are um, either referred by a temporary agency, so we call these temporary workers, or we have, la lastly, a leased employee, okay? So these are the top, the six common ones that you would normally see uh, that are used today, okay? But again, if you want more information on what kind of information that you want to have for employees, um, it's going to be um, uh, irs.gov slash publication 15, which is all about employees and how to tax them and uh, what they, what they which ones you can tax, okay? So... For this class, because we are learning payroll, the only two types of employees that will show up on your payroll itself is going to be your common law and your statutory employees. Everybody else is going to be considered as an expense. So therefore, when we talk about the rules and guidelines on how you pay these people, right, 
the, the, the common law and your statutory, you're not only paying them, you're not compensating them, you're paying for their benefits. You're paying for their Social Security, their Medicare. You're paying for everything that constitutes into having employees. While everybody else, they're all going to be separate t type of people and you're only paying them a straight bill. You're paying them an expense and these people here, the last four people, they are subject to file their own taxes with uh, the uh, appropriate 1099 or whatever kind of form that they need to fill out for saying that you did work for this company. Okay, and we'll go through each one. Right? So let's talk about our common law employees. So it's pretty straightforward. When you have um, common law employees, this is what they can do for you. You have a specific task, you give them, you tell them when to do it, and you tell them how to do it. Okay, and you tell them where to do it. Okay, so again, in this case, you have full control over what they, what a common law uh, employee can do. So as you, if when you apply for a job, obviously, you get a list of what your tasks is in contributing to your position, right? Or uh, roles that you're, uh, that is, is whatever uh, position that you're applying for, you have certain specific roles. For example, right? Um, if I apply as an admin, right, I only take care of admin duties, which entails, which lists a whole bunch of things, right? I have to take care of, I have to answer the phone calls in the front office. I have to assist anybody that walks in through the door, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of lists and details, and you want to make sure because as a common law, um, as a common law employee, you need to have that list of, of things so you can know your boundaries on, on what you can do, what you can't do, all right? So again, you're given a specific task, you're, to, you're told when to come in, you're also told how to complete the task, and you're also told where to do to complete the task. So again, all of those are ne necessary because again, common law is that you have, that the employer has full control of what they do. Okay, that's very important. So if I'm a regular, a uh, regular hourly wage person. I need to come into the office from eight to five, okay? And my tasks are gonna be the list that I'm given. And I'm told where to do it, when to do it, and how to do it, right? Here, this is how you do it, okay? So that's your common law um, employees. Pretty straightforward, all right? Just think of them as your regular people. Statutory employees. Now they're a little harder to explain, but they are going to be considered people that you do pay under your payroll, right? And usually they're the ones that don't do that don't do the main core operating business, right? They're the ones that help, um, I guess, help operate in a separate way. So, for example, a truck driver, right? If your if your store is a grocery store, right? You need to employ these people to deliver or bring the stuff to the store from the uh, third party vendor or whoever you're receiving the items from. Those are going to be considered your statutory employees because in this case, you are telling them what to do, what the task is. You are telling them how you want to get it done and you are giving them the, um, the, um, the time the, like, of when to do it. Okay. However, they are not the kind of people that have to come into the office every single day. They're the ones that come in every once in a while. So as you can see, as you can see for the example of a delivery truck person, right? Do they come to your, the store every day? They can if they're obligated to, like let's say um, the, the today's shipment is um, all the chips and all the home appliances and the next day is all the dairy and the next day is all the produce, okay? So if that's the case, then they're still going to have to come in every day. However, again, driving is one of those tedious things that can take long, long hours, right? You don't know. You can't predict, right? So in this case, that's going to be the example that the truck driver doesn't have to come in at the store exactly at 8 o'clock and clock out exactly at five o'clock. They come in and go, all right? As long as they get the task done exactly how you ask them to do it and in within the timely manner. So in this case, 
a truck driver is an example. Other ones are going to be, um, you know, a worker who works um, at home, okay, with all the supplies that were provided. And what they do is they uh, provide the services um, given whatever they can accomplish it, right? So again, like a travel salesman, right? Their job is to just sell the product, right? Obviously, they're receiving the product, but they do it on their own time, okay? They're not required to do much, okay? They're, they're not required to come into the office every single day at a specific time, as long as they dedicate their time and they do their job and get the tasks done, okay? So that's the difference between a common employee and a statutory, is that the statutory, their times don't have to be exact as long as they get the task done, when it's assigned, and how it's being done is the, is the question here, right? Any questions so far? Okay. So with those different types of common law and your statutory employees is that your common law, because they're both going to be on your payroll system, your common law are subject to withhold uh, federal tax income, uh, federal income tax withholdings from their paychecks. And as the duty for the company, we are subject to also um, have to pay for their Social Security and their Medicare. Whereas statutory employee, or employees, they are not required to uh, do any withholdings with these guys. Okay? Just because they're not a nine to five. They're not coming in at a specific time or regular time, okay? But however, because we are employing them as under our payroll system, we are subject to have to pay for into their Social Security and their Medicare, all right? They get to keep their income tax withholding though, okay? So that's just the huge difference between the common law and the statutory. Now, in most cases, they just combine them into one. Um, they just squish uh, the statutory and just make them as a common law, right? Um, but in, yeah, but that's just most cases, right? Any questions so far for the first two types of employees? No? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, move on to the last four. So the last other four that we're going to talk about is going to be um, the uh, statutory non-employees, and then you also have your independent contractors, lease employees, and temporary agencies. Well, first, let's go ahead and knock these two out. So the first one's going to be your statutory non-employees. Now, these are the people that, um, you know, usually um, in this kind of cases, they are uh, either direct salesmen or they are real estate, right? They have a company that they work for, but however, um, they're not contracted to come in at in the office every day. So as you, for example, a real estate, right? You're not required to go in at all times or specific times. You're, you're only required to go in when you have to deal with a customer or a client. So in this case, um, you know, you're, you're not technically told when to do your job. Right? You just come in when you have to do your job, when you need, when you are a sales representative. Okay? So when you need to get the task done. Okay? So oftentimes those are going to be your real estate people, your direct salesmen people, or even agricultural workers. Okay? And how they are, they are going to be um, a section. So when you do fill out your 1099 form, you can choose whether you are an independent contractor or a statutory non-employee. So in this case, you are going to be still filling out another 1099 form for this particular position. Okay. And again, um, yes. Now the difference between a, a real estate person, right? They are given everything, right? They work for the company. They're given all the tools and they're given all that stuff. However, they're going to determine how the end result is and they're going to determine when they need to come into the office. The difference between that and an independent contractor is that the independent contractor, they work for the company, however, they provide their own equipment, they tell, they determine when they want to work, and they determine how the end result is. So for example, a doctor's office, a dentist's office, 
um, even a, um, a tax accountant office, right? You can have multiple CPAs in one law firm, or I'm sorry, in one an accounting firm. However, they all provide their own service. They all come in whenever they have the clients to come in for, and they provide their own equipment, and they determine what their result is, okay? So again, any person that provides that type of service, right, they're going to obviously produce different results. Same thing with doctors, right? One doctor may have this opinion, the second doctor might have a different opinion. So that is the difference between uh, a real estate and a doctor or um, an independent contractor. They still have to fill out the 1099 form, okay? But um, in this case, um, they uh, both of these, they are subject to have to uh, keep track of their own income taxes. And at the end of the year, they have to file their own uh, taxes as an independent contractor or it comes to tax statutory Okay, so that means uh, they are responsible for their own taxes that they have to pay, all right? They can't, uh, for some cases, again, I'm not a tax expert, but in some cases, uh, independent contractors, they, can't, they do have that leeway where they can take extra um, deductions or they don't get taxed as much, okay? Uh, but yes, all right? So they determine the result is completely different um, however, yeah, that's the, that's the difference between the two. Okay. Lastly is going to be the most common one that you will see here or anywhere in the United States. It is going to be your leased employees as well as your temporary agency employees. So again, pretty straightforward, right? If you are working at a temporary agency, you are contracted to that agency. And what this agency does is they find work for you, okay? So who's paying the the who's paying you? Your employee in the the the, the temporary agency is is paying you, okay? They can pay you a lower rate that the company is paying this temporary agency to help them find job uh, people like you to go get to complete the task and job, and in this case. When you're doing, when you are a leased or sorry, a temporary agency worker, right? Your task job is going to be determined on what that company is looking for. All right. And you're just going to sign a contract saying that you agree. And most cases, temporary work agencies, it's a temporary project or job that the company needs to just get done for that month or however many days. So again, uh, many times at um, temporary agencies, right? Here in um, here we have Robert Half. If you guys have heard of them, he is an accounting temporary agency, and he helps individuals find jobs in the uh, accounting field. All right, and the major corporations such as MGM or even smaller businesses, they go to, they pay a huge portion to Robert Half to help them find these kind of people. They, they need a temporary job. They need to um, do a temporary uh, uh, budgeting for this specific event, right? That's only lasts for a couple months. So again, you are contracted to the temporary work agency to complete a small task for a company. There, you are getting paid by the temporary agency, not the company itself, okay? So that is, one difference here and a temporary job is it's, it's just like its name it's temporary it's only it's only maybe three six or even one whole year and then that's it but once the, the task is done you're you have to you're going to be given another task or another job that you have to apply for okay now this is the best way that major companies can get a task done without having to pay into their social security or have to pay any extra benefits. So as it, this again, you're going to be a mere expense to the company. And this is one of the best things that you can do for your company because again, you don't wanna to have to pay so much money into having all these employees and having to provide all these benefits and deductions to them. You'd rather just pay them as a straight expense to either an agency or to that person directly. 
and then have them be responsible for all their taxes, okay? Now, most common things that happen too is that a leased employee and a temporary agency, they can collide, all right? So for example, um, uh, so for example, my fiance, he worked at, he was working at a temporary agency um, for uh, an IT company uh, that he looked, he found um, on, uh, what is it, um, Indeed. There's that little uh, agency that you can look for for a specific, uh, uh, specific career. So he did IT. So he was working for, I think it was like IT solutions or something, desert solutions or something like that. It's a huge temporary agency. However, what they do is they contract with them. And what you can do is as a leased employee, you, they can buy, the company can buy out the contract from the temporary agency and employ them. So that's why um, the leased employee and the whole um, temporary agency, they can come, they can collide in one another. So what a leased employee is, is pretty straightforward. You are doing temporary work. However, the company is just borrowing you. Just like they borrow, uh, like you could borrow a car, right? You could lease a car. But in this case, you're borrowing this person as a, um, as a person that just does a task for you or completes a project for you. And the only difference here is that they can buy out the contract and actually uh, uh, you know, have you either employed permanently or you could be employed temporarily. So that's just the difference between leased and um, uh, your temporary agencies, okay? All right, any questions in regards to this? They say they, they are going to be a very expensive to the company. You're not subject to pay anything unless you become an official employee, okay? There's lots of rules and guidelines on, on this as well. If you are an independent contractor and you get and you become an employee later on, then yes, you get to do all that benefits. However, your company can, can't take you in as an independent contractor, then take you in as an employee, and then fire you and hire you back up as a independent contractor. That is a no-no. Once you establish them as an employee, they're forever an employee. So they can, you cannot drop them and um, you know make them as a mere expense afterwards. So that's why it's very crucial that you pick and choose your employees. Okay, so yes, you can, a company can have both. They can have their regular employees, and they, on the other side, they can have independent contractors, leased employees, or temporary agencies. Okay, so any questions in regards to these, all these types of employees? No? Okay, so let's go ahead and dive right into the payroll process. Well, first off, we got to have to um, first initiate this. So there, when you're dealing with taxes, okay, so what we're doing here is we're looking at a manual payroll service or a manual, how to do, how to conduct manual payroll, okay? I need, I want to show you this so then when we move into QuickBooks, on how easy it is to just pay someone else to do payroll because you're gonna you're gonna see how complicated it is for each individual person that you have to calculate in order to for sure like uh, go through every single thing that they need to be calculated for all their federal taxes if you if uh, if the state charges taxes you can talk about the state taxes so each individual person is gonna have different guidelines different rules and so on and so forth so here, let's go ahead and talk about the, the, the steps to, um, to, to initiate the process of payroll. So we're going to be dealing with employees' taxes first. Tomorrow, we're going to go ahead and take a look at employer taxes, okay? What the, what the employers are subject to do, subject to have tax for, for having employees. So the first one that we're going to be looking at is going to be um, submitting, obviously, a form to the IRS and as well as the Department of um, Educa not Education, uh, Employment. You need to let them know that you have employees. That's number one. 
All right, and we'll talk about each step uh, after this. After this, okay. So you have to initiate that. You need to let people. You need to let the government know that you have employees. Then the second thing is going to be is collecting their W four form, because their W four form is going to tell you what the employee wants you to withhold from their taxes. So again, uh, we'll talk briefly about that as well. Then the next step three is going to be determining three things. You're going to be determining the payment period. How often are you going to pay your employees? All right. How much income are you are going to be willing to? Um, uh, how much how much income is each employee able to earn? All right. Are they going to be wage? Are they going to be salary? Are they going to have bonuses, commissions? Example. Okay. And then we're going to also tell, uh, and then we're also going to recognize how are you going to record these these um, earnings, or how are you going to have them record that they earn this money? Okay. And then step four is where you're going to actually start calculating their taxes. So again, they're subject to federal income tax withholdings. They may be subject to, they're definitely subject to Social Security and Medicare. And if they're in, if they're in uh, the state that charges taxes on top of that, then you have to figure out what state taxes that are involved. Okay? And then lastly, you're going to need to record it and pay them with a check, with a paycheck. Then tomorrow we'll talk about what the employer is subject to do, right? Once you've finished, you have to complete the employees first in order for you to complete your employer's taxes, okay? So once you figure out what their total earnings is, that is where you're going to go ahead and complete your, pay, your, your um, employer taxes. So you could be subject to company FICA, which again, we will talk about in a second right whatever social security um and medicare that the employee puts into um their uh or pays into the company is mandated to match them 100 percent. okay other than that you're also subject to federal unemployment tax you're and if and if you're depending on the state you may be subject to state unemployment tax and other things that you that could be um, something that you could pay taxes to is could be workers' compensation. All right, that's a very popular one that most, if not all, businesses are looking forward to have. Okay, and then once you record the taxes, then you have to go ahead. Step number three is determine what date you're going to pay these liabilities to to the government. Right. So for today, we're only going to focus on the employees section all right all right so step number one we talked about that submitting your uh the information that you have employees to either or right obviously you're going to have to um submit it to the irs which is the federal but you also have to submit it in the state that you have employees for so in this case in the state of nevada we have it it's called Dieter uh for short which is also known as Department of um, Employment, Training, and Resources. So in this case, um, this specific division is going to be the new employees or the new hire um, unit um, division under DITA, DITER, okay? And basically, here's the form. So the company is going to submit a W-2 form to this agency right here. And what they do is it's basically a list. Okay, so the W-2 form for uh, employers are going to look different than employees. Employers, it's going to have a list of every single employee that is that is that you're planning to employ. So in this case, the form is going to have their full legal name, their social security number if they have one, if they have a work permit or whatever, uh, a temporary social security, you need to place that information there. Other things that could be coming to factor here is, is are they an American, or, or sorry, are they a U.S. citizen? And if they are, then there you go. How much are you gonna pay them, okay? So those information is something that you need to have readily available when you submit this to the um, uh, either IRS and the state, that agency that is going to be responsible to let you, to, uh, for you to let them know that you have employees, okay? 
So again, it's very important, especially if you are want to do this professional like uh, legally. You never want to pay your employees under the table. That's illegal. Okay. I know company. There are some companies that actually do that. It is illegal. All right. And you may have to pay a hefty fine if the government finds out that you have an employee, but they ha you haven't registered them. They can find you up a, a, a really hefty fine for that. You, you can never, you shouldn't pay your, your employees under the table. Okay, so there you go. That form is this one right here, the W-244 employee earns, okay? So once you fill that out, then the next step is to collect the W-4 form from your employees. So. For those, for you guys, okay, since you guys are, um, you know, have a potential possibility of um, applying for another job in the future, you guys are subject to have to fill out a 2021 or whatever you guys uh, apply for a new job, of course. Whatever form that you're going to fill out, you're going to be filling out the 2021. Now, if you guys filled out anyone, any form prior to 2020 there's a huge revision and a huge difference between them so um back then um so 2020 2019 and earlier their forms were very simple to fill out okay this one's a little more complicated in this case it's pretty straightforward. The first section, you fill out your name, and so on and so forth. So let me go ahead and pull up that file for you. So again, you're filling out your your uh, W uh, your W four form, right? You fill out your name, you fill out your social security number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. Back then, you're able to claim allowances or withholdings allowances. So if you have dependents, those are going to be considered one. Um, one uh, one allowance per child, right? If you're the head of household, that's one um, that's one allowance there. If you're gonna file as married status, that's one allowance for you. In this case, they completely scrapped that whole idea and threw it out the threw it out the window. Now, if you fill out the new W four form, which you guys will be if you guys do not have if you guys are planning to. Uh, get employed after this, you are subject to fill this out. And the e they do recommend you to go ahead and go to irs.gov and fill out their in their um, tax estimator because that's going to help you fill out this form a lot more easier. So of course, the, the difference nowadays is that now with the whole idea of 2020, Right, 2020 is when they actually made the the um they created the new form. Now they're considering a couple factors. Of course, with the new society now, we can have multiple jobs easily. Okay, okay. For example, I can have a primary job that's my eight to five, and then I can go ahead and after I get off my job, I can work from six to six to ten by doing Uber, Lyft, Postmates, or Grubhub. I can do any of those. That's going to be considered a secondary job. And now what they're considering now is that instead of filing two separate W-2, W-4 forms for each different company, they're only allowing you to file one, uh, one W-4 form that's, that's going to take into consideration of all of the income, including your spouses. So this is a completely different form. Um, it's again, it's a lot harder to fill out, um, uh, but they did change a few things here. And instead of calculating withholdings, you're actually going to be calculating your amounts as a yearly income. Okay. Okay. So first, um, the new W four form. So again, you will be uh, you will be filling out your information, and your options is that are you going to be filing as a single status? or filing married but filing separately, okay? Or are you gonna file as married file jointly? Or the third option is you could be head of household. So here, you don't even get to take an allowance. Your options are these options here, okay? 
So once you fill out this portion here, now the next section is going to ask you, okay, so what other multiple jobs or even spouse's income are going to be considered? So again, with, you know, 2020 being, um, you know, available to have second jobs, um, you know, they want you to report it all in one area. So in this case, if you do have a secondary job apart from your primary job, you need to fill in the information down here. If you're filing jointly, okay, as married jointly, you need to put your spouse's, in, your spouse's income as well. So what they're doing here is essentially they're tallying up your total household income, okay? All right, and that's the difference here. So this is going to go towards your total income that you have from your primary and your secondary. And if you have a tertiary job, then you got to fill it in here as well. Okay? So that's the rules here. Then the third section is claiming dependents. Okay? So again, dependents could be your actual own children or it could be um, someone who's disabled that uh, you're taking care of. All right? So again... Um, and in this case, they, it's not a withholding. It's going to be based on um, the number of ch the number of dependents that you claim. So if it's your real children, right? Anybody that's under 17, right? We know it as 26. It's now 17. All right. You can claim for every amount that you claim. It's it's going to be that number multiplied by two thousand dollars. Now. I don't know about you, but they're saying that every year in extra income, you're going to be spending an extra $2,000 per child. Now, I don't know about you, but $2,000 is very small. <laughs> um, so yes, they, they, uh, they have you calculate it right here and say, if I have two dependents, they're $2,000 each. So that means I'm going to deduct $4,000 from my whole entire amount of income. Now, before I continue on, right, then the, your dependents are $500 each. Here's the thing. Usually withholding, withhold, withholdings, right, or um, dependents, they're taking, they're deducted uh, from your paycheck before you get taxed. In this case, they're deducted after you get taxed. All right, which is weird, right? Everyone's used to doing it before. No, in this case, the, these deductions are, be t are being taken after your, uh, after your federal income tax. Okay. And then lastly, any additional withholdings or, uh, for example, uh, any other things like, uh, so if you, um, if you own stocks, that's going to be considered other income. So, um, so you have to also take into consideration, like, not just only your job. If you have passive income, you need to you need to add it in here. If you have any other uh, deductions or any other um, uh, we call it withholdings, you need to subtract it out from here. And then lastly, then you'll find out what your any additional withholding from your that that's your um, total that you are going to be claiming. Okay, so that is the new W four form for you. Okay. A lot more complicated, a lot more detail oriented, and especially because the government, they want every every dollar, okay? They want every single penny that they can claim, okay? Any questions so far about the W-4 form? So if you guys do plan on going into employment after this, and um, you do, you you are subject to have to fill one of these out, and um, they do say it on the form as well too. You can go to irs.gov, and they have what's called the um, the uh, the they have what's called the tax estimator. So here, I'm going to go ahead and show you that lid real quick. What that looks like. So if you are um, um, just wanting to uh, see what that is, so basically you're going to go to irs.gov, right? And you're going to go ahead and click on forms at the top. Okay, let me close this out. You're going to go to um, your forms at the top. Okay, so let me see. Um, so forms and instructions. 
okay? Once you get here, right, then you're gonna scroll down and you're gonna find your W-4 section. So right here, form W-4. So here, they have your W-4 that you can click, you can go ahead and grab it right off the website, or you could do the tax withholding estimator. So if you actually click on this, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be asked a series of questions. And every question that you fill out, right, it makes it a lot more easier, right? If you can answer the question, then that at the, at the very end of this estimator, it will it will give you not only uh, not only your estimate of how much taxes that you're gonna um, be receiving at the end of the year, it's also going to uh, produce your W four form for you automatically, and you can download it and just submit it to your employer. Okay, and the great thing about this tax as withholding estimator is that it also allows you to. Um, maximize or minimize how much tax that you're going to be getting back at the end of the, at the, end of the year. So most cases, uh, you know, this is also one of the things that you can take advantage of for, um, and it also allows you to see what other extra deductions or uh, extra things that you can claim. Now you want to be careful with this. Could you say it again, please? Sorry. So um, anything that's extra, right, you want to be careful with this because, again, if you're going to be utilizing this to maximize how much um, earnings you're going to get, obviously you're going to claim zero, zero, zero on everything, right? You're going to claim, I have zero dependents, I have zero things, and then claim them at the end of the year, okay? But in most cases, that's going to be the maximum amount that you'll get back as a refund. But let's say I don't want that money back. I want to take every penny right now. Then you can adjust this, uh, adjust this to say I only want um, a, a refund for I don't know le less than zero, uh, less than less than a hundred dollars. Then it will show you what you need to claim. All right. So that's what's really really cool about this tax estimator. Um, it's really cool. But then again, um, if that's the case and you want to do it that way uh, to try to you know gain as much money as possible. You can do that, but again, um, it, you, you definitely want to be very careful because sometimes, you know, this estimator is not going to really give you the uh, perfect um, answers. So you may claim something one year, and what's going to happen is that um, you may be subject to have to pay the government afterwards when you file your annual taxes. So you want to be careful, especially like, you want to read into every single deduction. Now, this is actually really, if you actually fill it out, it, it gives you a little information on every single option that you choose. So whether it's a deduction that you're claiming or a withholding that you're claiming, it will uh, it will give you a little um, information window that you can click on. So then when you, read, when you fill out this uh, questionnaire, you're actually understanding truly what every, every single thing is. Um, entails okay so again you can use this if you're not familiar on how to fill out your W-4 form because again it will ask you questions that are on the W-4 form but in a way that you're able to answer them okay so you can use this it's on irs.gov forms and uh, instructions and it's underneath uh, the W-4 form okay so that's something I wanted to show you guys, okay? Um, and again, uh, for this class, um, we are going to be looking at manual payroll, okay? So um, it's important that, um, yes. Other things that you should know that is, um, you know, some people, um, are, they're not going, uh, the, especially the IRS, uh, you want to keep it as clean as possible. If you are filling it out um, via with a pen, then, uh, you know, you, you want to be very careful because they will not accept it if you, like, cross out or delete anything. But nowadays, um, they have it readily available as a fillable PDF form, so you don't make those um, errors or mistakes, and it's written clearly. So, um, yes, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, that's just a little FYI, all right? Any questions so far? 
Yes, you can. You can definitely get this from, obviously, your employer. They must provide you the W-4 form, and they must provide you the most recent one. So if they give you a 2019, you, can't, you cannot fill that out. You, you would have to be obligated to go on IRS.gov yourself and fill and print out this copy of your 2021. All right, because technically you can, you're not you're not supposed to file um, tax. You are you're not supposed to file a W four form that's not in the same corresponding year. All right. Now, if you if you are currently employed and you have filled out a W four form prior, you are not obligated to fill out a new W four form unless. Um, given the circumstances that something has changed in your income or maybe this year or last year I was not married so I was single so I and I, and I decided not to I decided to file as a single status and then maybe this year I'm going to file as married and I'm going to file jointly with my fiance okay or future husband whatever you want to call him uh, but yeah maybe that's the case if you do have those kind of circumstances or if you do have those kind of changes, you want to fill out a W-4 form unless you absolutely don't want to claim anything and you want to get the maximum benefits from the government. So in this case, even if you are married, you can file as a single status or married for filing separately. You don't, you're not mandated to file jointly. So um, if that's the case, then yeah. Etc. Etc. But for any for any reasons you want to claim something, go for it. Um, again, um, you definitely want to be careful with that and make sure that if you do have those kind of changes, you do fill out the latest W form. Okay. Any other questions? No. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about payment periods, okay? Pretty straightforward. How often do you want to pay your employees? Because this is actually going to come into play, especially when we deal with our tax tables, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so determining how often you want to pay your employees. Are you going to pay them on the daily? Are you going to pay them every week? Um, Bi-weekly is every other week, so uh, in this case, in a total of a year, you'll claim 26 paychecks. Whereas if you do semi-monthly, right, you get paid twice a month. Semi-monthly, twice a month. So you're gonna get a total of 24 paychecks, okay? Now, again, usually most salary-based um, people, they're gonna be most likely to be on a semi-monthly because they get paid on the 15th and then they get paid on the last day whether it's the 30th or 31st, they get paid on the last day, okay? Other things I've seen before is monthly. So again, if you are working for uh, some kind of agency that you're getting a, get paid every month, I know the VA pays uh, their, their veterans every month. You know, anybody that's uh, re reaping uh, social security or benefits like that. So anybody that's re uh, receiving um, retirement, they get paid every month, okay? Usually it's the beginning of the month, and that's it. Um, I've never seen someone who gets paid quarterly. Um, that's every three months. Um, it could be for someone who is like, a, um, someone who does a law firm case, right? Their trial could be a monthly thing and they get paid when the um, person pays them, of course. Uh, but usually, if they're working for a company, they'll get paid either or. So that's more of a commission. Okay. Semi-annually, never heard of somebody getting paid every, uh, every, every six months or twice a year. And of course, annually. Annually is only used as a salary baseline. All right. I've never seen anyone get paid every year. Unless, you know, you're the owner of the company. But in this case, if you're the owner of the company, you're probably gonna take money either every day or even weekly, right? You need to pay yourself. You would never ever claim it as an annual as an annual income, all right? So usually in this case, um, being paid as an annual income is usually a, a baseline for salary wage um, employees. 
all right? So those are the difference between each and every single one. Common ones that you'll see, for example, daily, right? Pretty straightforward. Uber, Lyft, they all say at the end of the day, you can claim your earnings at the end of the day. So that's gonna be considered a daily payment, all right? A weekly payment, weekly and bi-weekly are, or sorry, weekly, bi-weekly, and semi-monthly are gonna be your more common ones that most companies use. Again, a weekly, um, you get paid every Wednesday. Uh, bi-weekly, you get paid every Friday. And then again, semi-monthly, you get paid on the 15th and 30 or 31st of the month. So these are the ones that you're more commonly gonna be seeing most often, uh, most likely you'll often see is a weekly, bi-weekly, or a semi-monthly. Again, um, the other four, not as common as you, uh, not as common as you need. Okay. So once you've done that, now we gotta go ahead and consider how much um, income a person can receive. So again, we talked about the difference between your compensations. So again, if you are uh, having employees, you've got to consider how are you going to pay them? How much are you going to pay them? Are you going to pay them on, a, on an annual rate? Or are you going to pay them on a month, uh, on a, um, an hourly rate? Right? So you can choose between, there's only two that are commonly known, which is the hourly wage and salary base. Right? So you can either pay, be paid um, based on how many hours you contribute, or you could be paid at a straight rate, which is a salary rate, and then it's just divided by the number of agents that you have. So it doesn't matter how many hours you work, you're gonna get the same amount every paycheck, okay? Now, of course, with each one, you also have other, uh, you know, other sources of income, such as if you are, if you earn tips. So here in Nevada, right, most, uh, most employees, right? They um, they have their tips considered as part of their um, income. So again, uh, uh, it's very common, especially here, right? Um, so with that being said, that means um, that because tips are going to be counted as towards your income, by law, the state of Nevada, they can give you a lower um, wage rate apart from the minimum that is in um, Nevada. So right now, the Nevada uh, minimum wage is not is no longer eight dollars and twenty five cents anymore. That was last year, um, but for this year, I believe right now it's nine dollars, and it's getting into talks to be uh, now ten dollars. So when that gets there, you know that's when you'll determine what your uh, wage rate is. But again, um, it's it's a it's a baseline that is required by the state that you have to pay your employees. Okay, um, and then other things that you can also have too is that you can have um, you can have commissions, bonuses, overpay, or you know overtime. Okay, um, you can uh, yes, overtime is going to be one of those options that you can earn money for. All right. All right, so once we figure that out, then now the next thing is we're going to be uh, determining what is going to be that, what deductions or what additional benefits that they can take on their paychecks. Okay, so that can include any fringe benefits, right? When you work for a company, right, if they are a major co co corporation, right, they can offer employees some fringe benefits. So for example, um, for, so for example, a, a company, right? Uh, I'm just gonna throw one out there, Quest Diagnosis, right? They are a major bio um, lab, right? They test for blood, they test the samples, right? Because they're such a well-known, big, huge corporation, right? Anybody who's an employee under there they get special benefits such as they can get discounts to specific theme parks. They can get a discount for being a triple A member. They can get a discount um, for um, telephone services, right? Those are gonna be considered fringe benefits. And if you did not know, it is going to be part of something that you may have to pay into, all right? 
Um, but those are the offers, things that, you, that um, fringe benefits can offer to your employees, right? If you are a major corporation and you say, hey, if you're an employee, you can take a discount because, you know, we're a corporation. We pay into AT&T. So you can take a 15% discount if you'd like, all right? That's considered a fringe benefit. Any other things that you can do offer as well as if you are the kind, so for example, here in Nevada, right, as a casino, you may or may be obligated to have to be uh, to work on your holidays. You can offer holiday pay. So if you choose to work on a holiday such as Christmas or Thanksgiving, you may be subject to a higher pay rate because you came in for that holiday when it's a national holiday. Some other casinos, they may actually work against you for that. Okay, you can also get PTO. So anything that's paid time off, such as vacation pay, sick pay, holiday pay, right? Other than that, and then you can also, um, if you want to, you can offer your uh, employees some retirement benefits. So again, a 401k plan, okay? Um, and then you can also offer insurance, whether it's health, mental, vision, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are going to be considered deductions to your paycheck, okay? If you have to pay union fees, there you go. Those, these are all going to be considered deductions to your paycheck, or in this case, vacation, sick, and holiday pay. Those are going to increase your income. But again, um, anything after that, so uh, example, um, you know, your insurance or your 401k, they're all going to be considered taking things out from your paycheck. Okay? So whatever benefits that you offer your employees or deductions, meals, if you have paid meals, that, that's actually going to uh, be part of your paycheck as well. Okay. And of course, in order to um, obviously um, keep track of it, if you are an hourly person or if you are a salary person, right, maybe you need to clock in just so that you have proof that you came in to the office or whatever, whatever means that you have. Um, you can have a check-in log. You can keep a timesheet somewhere. QuickBooks. Um, we'll talk about QuickBooks um, when we get into there, but QuickBooks does have a timesheet that you can fill out for employees. Um, activity logs, you know, a, even a physical punching clock. You have something like that. Any way to keep track of your uh, employees' hours or whether they came actually into the uh, proof that they actually worked, whatever means to collect that information is going to be how you're going to keep a uh, record that they actually attended. So, other than that, now we can talk about employee taxes, okay? So, let's go ahead and dive right in. So, employee taxes, first that you're subject to pay is going to be the federal income tax withholdings. So, it is by law that you are subject to pay this regardless of what company you pay for, because this is a federal, federal, it applies to all the states. And this is for the tax that you pay into every time you work for a company. So again, this is um, taxes that you are subject to pay to contribute to the bigger society. All right, so again, federal income tax withholdings is going to be based on how much you work and how much you earn. So again, the higher the wages, the higher the percentage rates, which means higher taxes. But obviously, if you, you know, have lower wages, then you're not going to have enough to survive, you know, so on and so forth. So again, higher wages equals higher percentage rates, which equals higher taxes. So the one thing I'm going to be talking to you about is going to introduce you to the, do, the two different types of methods that you can um, use to calculate federal income tax withholdings, okay? So you have the percentage method and you have the bracket method, okay? So either way, um, these are pretty straightforward. Um, in regards to the difference between the two, except one is for the bracket method, um, it's pretty straightforward. You are going to pull up a table, which is going to be the circular E table, which I'll talk about in a second, 
And what the bracket me uh, method does is it pretty much gives you, um, you know, uh, uh, how much you can make. And if you fall in that bracket, it's going to tell you your exact withholdings. Okay? Pretty straightforward. But I am not going to teach you the bracket method because it's too easy. I'm going to teach you the percentage method. Okay? So that's you, so you know that, okay? But just know that those two exist. Okay? And a circular E table, again, is going to be the irs.gov slash publication 15 T. All right? Now, when we, uh, so now that that is there, this is what the, um, this is what the tax tables actually look like. So here you go. I have the publication of 15 T to show you all the federal income tax withholding tax tables. So again, it's broken down into um, particular ones, ones that you're doing, right? The first one is going to be if you're doing, uh, uh, you're doing payroll, right? But you're using an automated service. So that's the first one. And then the second table is the bracket me method. And then each one is broken down based on what W or form that your employee has been submitted. So in this case, we are looking into going to be looking at percentage uh, percentage method, but using manual payroll, okay? And for our cases, we're looking at using the W-4 uh, form that is from uh, 2020 and later. So again, I've uploaded this for you to have on the Google Classroom in case you want to mess around or understand how or look at this um, table. So again, you're given about 10 tables in here. Um, so uh, yes, and each one is going to give you, a, uh, again, a detail. We're going to take a look at an example today when we calculate um, our first employee, you know, our first employee's uh, information. So again, there are two different W-4 forms. Again, we have the 2020 uh, later or we have the 2019. So if you do have someone who has uh, filed the W-4 form for 2019 or prior, they are going to continue to use the withholdings, all right? Anybody that's using the W-4 form for 2020 and later, so you guys, if you're applying for the job now, you guys are going to be having to calculate this. So for this class, I'm only going to choose one. I'm going to use the latest W-4 form just because we're in 2021. There's no point to calculate 2019 taxes. So these are the most up-to-date recent ones, okay? So again, as you can see, each tax table is broken into certain things. So it's going to be broken based on how often you get paid, so the paid frequency. It, <coughs> excuse me. And it's also going to be determined on your status. Did you file as married filing jointly or did you file as single uh, filing um, separately? Or are you the head of household? So if you remember from the W-4 form, that was the first set of questions it asked you. What is your filing status? So again, um, we're not going to be using these particular tables because this is for the automated one, but I am going to go to uh, table. Um, so it, as you can see, the bracket method, right? You just follow, you just follow the lines. If you made three hundred and forty-five dollars and made less than three hundred and fifty dollars, and this is what you get paid every. Uh, this is getting paid every. Uh, let me see, every day, right? You're just gonna follow this table along, and you're gonna find out that you're gonna be subject. Uh, to be taxed at a total of thirty uh, twenty-eight dollars. Okay, so that's the bracket method. But however, we're not going to be. I'm not going to be teaching you the bracket method. I'm going to be teaching you the percentage method. So let me go ahead and pull that table here, so you know exactly which table that you will be using. Now, for the example and anything that I provide in this class, I'll provide you the table. Okay, so you don't need to have this file open up and readily available. It's just for your practice purposes only. Okay, so um, again, for your practice only. 
but so here we're looking at percentage method tables uh, for manual payroll systems using the form W4 form from 2020 or later. So this is the tax table that we're going to be looking at and I'm going to show you exactly how to utilize this table and how to calculate the federal income tax withholding. Okay, so again, you are able to do it here. You have the list of guidelines on how to fill it out right here as well, um, in case um, uh, it, you know, in case you want to learn how to do each and every single one that's on there. Okay, but for this class, I'm going to go ahead and show it to you uh, via PowerPoint. Okay, so let's go ahead and get talking. So first things first is. Obviously, you need your W-4 form, so here's the table that we're looking at. I just showed you an example of what it looks like. So in this case, this is a married filed jointly, and they're getting paid at a weekly rate, and etc. This is what the table should look like. So we're going to be focusing on A, B, C, D, and E. All right? How are we going to compute this is? The, after you've figured out how much total income you've earned, you're going to go to this table and you're going to go ahead and compare A and B. So how much money you made. So let's say I made a total of $500, right? So the question is, for question A is, how much did you make more? I made definitely over $483. However, I did not make more than $866. I only made $500. So that means if I follow this line uh, 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 along, that means the government is not going to take any money from me. However, any money that is in excess, so they'll let me keep $483, any money that I made extra from taking out the first $483, it's going to be taxed at 10%. Okay? So now that I kind of figure, uh, figure things out, right? I'm going to compare A to B. I'm going to subtract E, multiply D, and add C. And I'll t uh, this will make sense when we dive right into the example. So here, the step to step on what you have to do. So because we're using a W4 form for 2020, you need to assume all of these things. So first thing is, you need to determine how much money you earn. Okay, which is pretty straightforward. If you're a salary base or if you're um, a wage base, hourly wage, then you're going to, to calculate your total amount, which is going to be, uh, you know, your total hours times how much your rate is. And what you're going to do is you're going to figure out how much that is according to an annual income. Okay, so that's very, very important that you know. This is different than um, doing um, your W-4 form from previous times. So in this case, we need to figure out how much you earn in according to uh, the information based on an annual um, income, okay? So you can take one of your paychecks or you want to determine how much the person earned and you're going to multiply it by the number of paychecks that you have, all right? And then once you do that, then you're going to go on your W-4 form and you're going to add any extra money. So any other extra information. So for the form uh, 4A, is going to be any other income that isn't from your primary job. Okay? And you're going to subtract any, uh, any extra deductions from your total amount of income. Once you figure that part out, then number three is where you determine to use the, um, the uh, circular E table, which is going to allow you to uh, check out your filing status, check out how much the uh, payroll period is, and, and then whether or not you, in step two, which is claiming additional income from a secondary job, if you check mark that, then you need to go on to one of the, the tables. If you did not check mark off that, then you're safe to be on the, the one. So if you didn't claim any secondary job, that's question number two. Once you figure that out, then you're going to go to the table. You're going to find the exact um, 
criteria that you belong into. So did you make this, but not over this? Then you're gonna go follow those lines across and determine whether, how much you're gonna get taxed, at what percentage, and at what excess, okay? Once you figure that step out, that's where step four comes into play, and you're gonna subtract any dependents, okay? Once you've done that, then you're gonna add any additional tax withholdings, and then that's how you compute your federal income tax withholding. So again, let's go ahead and take a few minutes to go ahead or, and dive right into the first scenario here. So we have an employee, her name is Elle, okay? She is a single woman with one dependent, okay? And she only has a primary job. Okay, so that's, you know, that means um, step number two is not gonna come into play. She's filing a single status, so therefore she doesn't need to um, enter in any information, and she only has one job, okay? So question number two is gonna be check mark. Okay? Or it's not gonna be check mark. Um, okay, so then once we establish that, now the next thing is it says I hear that she earns $15.25 an hour and her and she worked a total of 45 hours, okay? And she um, uh, she claimed her dependent, okay? And has no additional um, deductions. So that means she's only claiming her one child and that's it. Okay, and then now the payment period is going to be weekly, so she gets paid every week. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we've got to determine our first thing, which is the total number of earned wages. So in this case, how much does she earn? Six eighty-six twenty-five. Right. We take the um, we take the the rate and we multiply it by the 45 hours that she has contributed or worked. So she's earned a total of $686.25. So again, step two is you need to add any extra income and you also need to subtract any other deductions. In this case, she did not claim anything else and she only has one job. So in this case, both of those Part A and Part B are going to be zero. So therefore, we're adding zero to her account and we're subtracting zero from her account, making her total subject amount to be taxed at to be $686.25. So step two says, or uh, step two, step three says now we got to determine her federal income tax withholding. So from the things that we know, we know that her total wages is $686. We know that her pay period is going to be um, weekly. And we know she's filed as a single status. And of course, um, step two, right? If she worked, if she has more than one job, which in this case, no, she does not have another job. So in this case, now we're gonna go ahead and determine which circular E table to use. So in this case, I already did this, I already, searched it for you, right? We're on a weekly payroll period, right? She is single or filing as separately, but in this case, she's single, okay? And now the, the, the question is, are we gonna use the right side or are we gonna use the left side? The right side says that they check mark step number two, meaning she has additional income. On the left side says did not check number two and only has one income. So in this case, we're only gonna stay on the left side. So if she made a total of $686, what is her criteria? What does she fall under? Okay, so in this case, in this case, she made a total of $686, right? So in question A, question A asks you, how much money did she earn over? In this case, she's definitely made over $433. Step B says now, how much did she, but, but not over? So in this case, she definitely did not make over $1,021, okay? 
okay? So that means she belongs in this little line right here, okay? She falls under 433 and 1,021, okay? Because she's made more than 433, but less than $1,021, okay? So now we're going to follow this line across, all right? So now that we claim that it's this one, we know that for sure, for a fact, no matter when she files this, right, she's subject to have to pay $19.20, okay? She is also subject to pay 12% off of any extra money. So, the question is here that the government lets you keep $433. So this is where we're going to go ahead and take a look here. So first thing is, if the government's going to let me keep $433, I'm going to calculate that first. So here, my $686.25, subtract the $433, is going to give me a remaining of $253.25. That's the money that is in excess. So that means this amount here is going to be subject to an additional 12%. I need to calculate 12% of this extra income. So once I multiply the 253.25 by that 12%, it's going to give me $30.39. Okay? Once I figure that, I'm going to tack on how much the government's going to take from me, which is the 1920, to give me a grand total of withholdings to be $49 and 59 cents. Okay, so that's my total withholdings right now. Okay? Now, the last thing I have to also calculate is going to be my total dependents. So again, she's only claiming one dependent, right? Therefore, if you look at the little sheet on the um, on the uh, table, we are subject to being looking at table number five, which allows you to tell you how much it is going to be per, uh, how many paychecks that you have. So in this case, we're on a weekly payroll, so that means I have a total of 52 paychecks, okay? And of course, this is a little example here that you're gonna need to pull out is that for question number three, how many total um, children did I claim? She claimed a total of two, right? Two times 2,000 gives me a total of $4,000, okay? So now that I have that, therefore $4,000, right? So, um, oh, I'm sorry. She claimed only one, all right? She claimed only one, so I've got to fix that. So she only claimed one child. If she claimed one child, that means she's only subject to two thousand dollars that she of uh, per child, and we're going to divide that by the number amount of paychecks that she gets. She's a weekly payroll period, so that means she has fifty-two checks. So in this case, we're going to take two thousand dollars, divide by the fifty-two, and you get a total of thirty-eight dollars and forty-six cents. This is going to be deducted from your withholdings okay so I'm going to take my 49 59 and I'm going to subtract out that 11 I'm sorry that 38 dollars and 46 cents to get me a total of 11 dollars and 8 and 13 cents left that she is going to uh, be paying into the federal income tax programs okay so in this case um, you take your dependents after after you figure out your tax. So in this case, you get a little tax break here. Okay. So in this case, my federal income tax withholding is going to be $11.13 because again, step number five is that she claimed nothing else. So therefore, if she claimed nothing else, then um, her uh, total that she's going to be receiving is going, or um, that she has to pay into her federal income tax withholdings is going to be um, eleven thirteen. Now, for any reason, let's say we did, uh, we did say that she claimed two children, and uh, two times 
2,000 is going to give you 4,000, right? This is an example. If in this case we, she did claim two children and it does fall below zero, right? You, that means she's subject to pay zero for withholdings. So that's why I'm telling you now that if you do claim your children or if, if you do have dependents, it's actually going to give you a, a bigger tax break. Okay? You're going to pay less taxes if you have more children or etc. So this one's calculating uh, withholdings a lot more differently than before. Okay? Any questions so far? So in this case, we calculated how much money she made, right? We added any of her extra income. We subtracted any additional withholdings that she claimed or deductions, right? And then we found out what her total income is, taxable income. Then we go ahead and went and searched her circular E based on her filing status payroll period and how much she made. And we found out that she belongs into the table where she's subject to 12% um, tax. Okay? Then we figured out from, from, from the previous section here, we figured out that she's going, we're going to subtract out the amount that, that, we're, that she's allowed to uh, keep. So over here, you subtract how much you, that the government allows you to keep, then anything extra is going to be subject to that additional 12%. So that 12% gave us, um, yielded uh, $30.19, plus what the government's going to take from your paycheck automatically to get you a total of uh, $49.59. And of course, by claiming our child, we got an additional deduction of $38.46, leaving us $11.13. Any questions so far? This is going to be the most complicated one, but I'm going to make the scenario as simple as possible. Okay? okay. I just need you to know how to use the circular E table. That's the most important thing. Okay? I'm not going to have any, any other income. I'm not going to have any other deductions. Okay, so um, the most that you'll see is maybe a child or so. So after we claim that she has um, any zero, zero claimed any um, extra withholdings, then she is subject to the eleven dollars and thirteen cents. Okay. So of course, that was just the federal income tax withholdings. Okay. So again, when you become an employee, you are also subject to be taxed for the Federal Insurance Contribution Act better known as your Social Security and your Medicare. So when you do end up um, retiring from your job, you do at least get this benefit. Um, I think I think now it's 67. So is it 67 now? You're able to um, claim full 100% um, retirement benefits. Okay. So here's your old age survivors um, and disability insurance also better known as Social Security, okay? And then again, you have your hospital insurance, which is also better known as your Medicare, all right? These are fixed percentages. They haven't changed since I don't know when, but they haven't changed and they're still uh, the same rate today, okay? However, for Social Security, you are subject to pay 6.2% of your paycheck. So this is based on your gross earnings. So however much that you earn, you're going to pay 6.2% of your paycheck to Social Security. All right? And here is where it gets to you. You can only collect up to $1,042,800. All right? That's the new 2021 revision to the Social Security. This is how much you can pay into your own Social Security. This is the cap, all right? Now, of course, if you're only paying 6% of your paycheck and you don't make that much money, you're an average uh, person that's claiming maybe uh, $50,000 or less, 
you'll never reach this point. No matter how many years you work, you'll never ever reach this thousand dollar limit, this hundred thousand dollar limit. But if you are working as a, you know, someone who's making six figures, you're, you, you know, it's, you're obviously going to reach this maximum pretty, pretty easily. Okay. Now, of course, because it's based on a gross wage, right? Again, here, the example that Elle made $15.25 each, and she worked a total of 45 hours. It doesn't matter what the, the payroll period is. It doesn't matter what she claimed. All that matters is how much did she earn. And in this case, she earned $686.25, and she is subject to 6.2% of her paycheck is going to go straight to Social Security. So in this case, I did the calculation. It's $42.55 is going to go straight to Social Security. Okay? And then, of course, for Medicare, right, it's going to be 1.45%. And here's the great thing about Medicare. There is no limit. You can put in as much as you want uh, or for as long as you want, and there is no cap limit, okay? Um, again, and it's going to be based on your gross wage. So, again, L here, right, she made a total of eight, uh, $686.00 and you multiply it by the 1.45% to give you a total of $9.95 of that's going to go towards Medicare. Okay? All right, any questions? So these are straightforward ones, and it's required by law that you, uh, contrib you contribute to your own Social Security and your own Medicare. So again, this is something that you're actually paying into. All right? So once we do that, this is how you journalize it, okay? We're going to have a salaries and wages expense. That's going to reflect your total gross earned income, all right? Then anything after that, notice this. Why is my federal income tax, my Social Security, and my Medicare, why are they all liabilities? It's because who's paying you? The company's paying you, right? So therefore, the company is responsible to, to calculate these amounts, and what they do is they owe these agencies this money. You don't pay it out of your own pay, paycheck, per se. Like, you don't physically get a paycheck and pay it. The government is, I mean, the company is going to be responsible to pay it for you, okay? And there are special guidelines and stuff on rules on how often they have to pay and they're mandated to pay this okay and of course the checking after all the taxes are taken out then whatever um, amount that you have left is going to be your paycheck so in this case she earned a total of 686 and she's walking away with 642 okay any questions in regards to how to calculate um, taxes for the employees. Okay. Any questions? So as far as this particular section here, because the state of Nevada, you don't pay state taxes at all, um, I'm also going to be testing you this bare minimum. Is that the bare minimum that you need to know is you are subject to federal taxes. And the, the top three federal taxes are the income tax, the Social Security, and Medicare. Those are the three things, okay? And that's all I'm asking you here. I'm not going to throw in any other additional stuff as such as, you know, um, what if I have a retirement benefit or what if I give fringe benefits? That does not matter because it depends on your company, right? Do you Are you willing to offer it? Are you willing to pay to have employees and offer those extra things to them. Do you even have enough money to be able to cover all of those expenses? So all those, okay, I'm going to assume that we are such a small company that we cannot afford any of those benefits. So you're going to work for us. The only thing that you're going to be taking out is just the bare minimum of the federal income, uh, the federal taxes. That's it. Of course, state of Nevada, no state taxes. So that's all I'm requiring you to know for this class. 
So I just need you to know how to calculate federal income tax and how to calculate Social Security and Medicare. Any questions? No? All right. So tomorrow we're talk we're going to talk about employer taxes because we solved for uh, the employee taxes. So again, tomorrow we continue with that. If you guys don't have any other extra questions, then technically you guys are free to go. It's 11 for 40.